going to get promptly started. It is 9.30. Good morning. It's wonderful to see everyone. Welcome to campus and welcome to the Fall Public Child Welfare Dialogue. My name is Alice Egan. I coordinate the Title IV program in the Sandra Rosenbaum School of Social Work. And I'd like to start today with a land acknowledgement for this beautiful place that we're sitting today. The University of Wisconsin-Madison occupies ancestral Ho-Chunk land, a place their nation has called Dejop since time immemorial. In an 1832 treaty, the Ho-Chunk were forced to cede this territory. Decades of ethnic cleansing followed when both the federal and state government repeatedly, but unsuccessfully, sought to forcibly remove the Ho-Chunk from Wisconsin. This history of colonization informs our shared future of collaboration and innovation. Today, UW-Madison respects the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation along with the 11 other First Nations of Wisconsin. To all of you, we're so pleased that you took this morning to come and learn together from our speaker. <laughs> On our registration list, and in this audience, I see undergraduate, graduate students, PhD students, faculty and staff. I see Title IV alumni and people who supervise our Title IV students and our other MSW and BSW students in their field placements. I see policy social workers and people from public and private child welfare, as well as other community partners. So it's really wonderful that we're all here to learn together, and we're just really glad you're here. A couple of logistical items before I get on to the introduction. Um, CEUs will be emailed to you. If you didn't check in at the registration table with your name, please make sure you do so, because that's how we'll know um, who to send CEUs to. Also, Dr. Kim will be making available some of her presentation materials, and those will be emailed to participants after today's talk, along with a brief evaluation. There's also going to be a real quick stretch break about midway through, um, but do feel free to help yourself to refreshments throughout, or get up and move around if you need to. Okay, on to the reason we're here. If I counted correctly this morning, this marks our 41st Public Child Welfare Dialogue. As part of our goal to strengthen Wisconsin's public child welfare workforce and produce social work leaders in the field of public child welfare, we've invited many bright, talented, and innovative leaders, leaders in research, policy, and practice to be our dialogue speakers. And I know that you're going to find today to be no exception to that. I'm so pleased and excited to introduce you to Dr. J. Ron Kim, who's here today to discuss the impact of color evasive practices in adoption. I'm going to just read a little bit from her bio, and she may have more to share, but Dr. Kim is an associate professor in the School of Social Work and Criminal Justice at the University of Wisconsin in, at, or not Wisconsin, the University of Washington at Tacoma. Prior to completing her doctoral degree, she worked with foster and adopted children and families and with adults with disabilities in residential care. Dr. Kim's research is focused on the well-being of adoptees, exploring race, disability, and transnational experiences for adoptees. Her research includes the racial, ethnic, and adoption socialization practices of Korean American adoptee parents, out of home care for adoptees, and adult inner country adoptees with adoption displacement experiences. Dr. Kim's research also explores the preparation and training of professional social workers, and that's why we're all here today. So, welcome, Dr. Kim. We're so pleased and honored that you're here with us. Thank you, Alice. Hi everyone, can you hear me okay? Okay, um, all right, so thank you for that introduction. I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about me as well. So I was born in 1968 in Daegu, South Korea, and I was adopted to Minnesota, suburb of Minnesota, so I'm kind of your next door neighbor, um, in 1971, where I was raised by a white adoptive family. They had two children who were uh, both born to my parents, so I was the only adopted person. I was the only Korean person pretty much in my whole school, neighborhood, church, you name it. Um, and this is going to be a, an important part of my uh, talk today is about my experiences growing up as one of the only with this unique experience that most people just didn't understand because they understand adoption and they saw me as a Korean adoptee as, well, this is such a good thing, it's all win-win for everybody. Uh, but I'm going to talk to you about what those challenges are and how that might affect you if you're working with uh, adoptees of color in your practices as child welfare workers, as clinicians, as instructors, um, whatever your professional capacities might be. Then I moved in 2015 to Tacoma, Washington. 
Um, and I don't know about you, but place means so much to me. It probably means a lot to you. You think about the, the connections that you have, the people who are there to support you, and all of these different places. So I put this up here to show you um, how I see myself located in terms of where I've been, where I'm going, my, my locations, my communities, because community is really a big part of the work that I do and the reason why I do the work that I do. So in 2006, I was uh, just finishing up my master's degree in social work at the University of Minnesota, and I was a child welfare scholar. So some of you who are in the room who are Title IV-E scholars or alumni, yay. Um, so I, I was one of those uh, students as well. And afterwards, I got hired at Hennepin County, which is the largest county in the state of Minnesota. And I was a child welfare, um, Wendy's Wonderful Kid child specific recruiter. So they had, Wendy's Wonderful Kids had a contract with Hennepin County. And so I wor was working there for a couple of years, working with youth, basically 12 to 17 years old. I did have a couple who are younger, but they were siblings of kind of the targeted client and uh, working to find permanency for them. <coughs> well, the regular child welfare system, as you know, is very complicated, and I was uh, laid off as part of a round of budget cuts at Hennepin County. So after 18 months working specifically with Wendy's Wonderful Kids, then I moved on to another organization and did post-adoption services for a while. And then from there, um, I ended up at the University of Minnesota, working at the Center for Advanced Studies and Child Welfare, where I continued to focus on adoption, specifically looking at some of the areas that we don't talk about very much. Um, and that's going to be a theme that I'm going to be talking about today, is that I've been very curious, because when I was a grad student in my MSW program, and then eventually when I went on to do my PhD, I was really thinking a lot about the foundational practices that we were um, doing in child welfare and the research on it. There's a lot of research on adoption. Most of it is written about post-placement, the adjustment period right after adoption. Most of it does not really look at what happens after um, finalization and what happens when the state, the county, or the agency is no longer involved with these families. But Back in Minneapolis in 2000, I connected with a Korean adoptee friend of mine and we went to Korea and I suddenly found out that there was this whole world of other people who were adopted. Before that point, I'd grown up in such isolation that I really didn't know any other adopted people. Something you don't talk about. In fact, later on I found out that one of my childhood friends was a Native American adoptee and neither of us ever talked about that we were both adopted. She was also adopted by a white family. Um, so what I learned through being in community with other adoptees from about 2000, late 99 to 2000 to today is that adoptees are talking about all the experiences they have and none of it is reflected in the research. So one of the things that compelled me to go back into um, a PhD program and do research was to try and, as a good friend of mine said, bear witness to the experiences of adoptees who aren't shown in their uh, kind of full developmental life histories are not really represented in the research. And this is important because especially when we're talking about race and culture and adoption experiences, um, if we don't know what to see and to anticipate with those of us with these lived experiences as adults, then we're not doing practices for them when they're children that are going to set them up to be successful and to have full lives. Right. So in 2006, as I said, uh, I started this blog called Harlow's Monkey. Uh, anybody want to take a guess at why it's named Harlow's Monkey? Anyone remember who Harry Harlow was? Yeah? Someone want to be brave enough and say something about it? Can you do yes. Attachment research with monkeys? Yeah, can you say more about what? Right. If they didn't have their mother, they wouldn't attach to an object, but it wasn't, I don't remember. <laughs> You're on the right track, yeah. Anybody else know, have uh, other details? Right. Yes? Some of them had a source, but not the comfort of the cloth, and then yes. the other set didn't have a cloth. If I remember correctly, they preferred the more comforting. 
That's right, yes, right. Um, so what Hannah was saying is um, some of them had a food source, so they had a bottle of milk or food, um, but the substitute mother was just a wire, it was just wire with a bottle attached. Um, kind of like what you see in a cage with guinea pigs and stuff, they just have the, the water, the food source there. Um, there was another um, some monkey that was covered that did not have the food source but had um, a soft terry cloth covering. And when the monkeys were scared, they would always go to the one that had the soft comfort over the food. So it really was his way of trying to think about um, nature versus nurture, whether or not um, when we think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the things that we need like uh, food um, over comfort and a sense of belonging. Um, yeah, so I had, you know, in my MSW program, I had learned about Harry Harlow and the monkey experiments, and I was like, I feel like I'm a, sub, like I'm a monkey, that I was raised by a substitute mother. Right? So th this is one of the reasons why I called my blog Harlow's Monkey, because I was trying to explore this idea of um, adoption and, and parenting and attachment and bonds and all of those things. So I graduated in 2015 with my PhD, and I ended up in Tacoma, Washington. Okay, so I'm hoping everybody is really excited to be active. I've got a Mentimeter, so if you have a smartphone, would you please uh, either log in or you can use a QR code. And you should see this picture. Is it working? Oh no. No, it's not working. We can just type So try the code also. Yep. Is the code not working? I think it's just the angle or the lighting or something. The website works. If you go to Mentimeter, you can enter 7548112. All right, so I've told you about myself. I'd like to get to know who you all are. You can choose more than one because, like myself, I have many different roles and hats. I identify as many things, so I'd like to see who, who you all are. there is representation in all these other different areas as well and I use Mentimeter because sometimes I would um, I would do this like kind of who's in the room and there are some people who you know don't want to necessarily reveal their identity especially if they're part of a birth or a first family member or um, sometimes if they're an adoptee or a foster alum so uh, thank you all for for participating in this little survey here Okay, so I hope that I can be speaking to all of you as we go through this um, presentation today. Oops, here we go. Okay, so I wanted to give you just a little bit of information about transracial adoption in the United States, and these are from the last two census surveys. 
You may not know, but up until 2000, we did the ask if a child living in a home was adopted or not. So 2000 was the first time we ever asked whether or not there were adopted children living in a home. And then in uh, 2010, uh, those questions were asked again. We're still waiting for the 2020 census data to come in, so we, I don't have that information for you. But one of the things that you can see here is the number of adopted uh, children that are in the home. You can see that the numbers uh, declined a little bit from 2000 to 2001, but the number of transracial adoptions increases during that time, the percentage. Okay, let's go back to Mentimeter. And if anybody remembers, Colbert used to do this whole series about I don't see race. Um, so go back to Mentimeter again, and I want to know what the word colorblind means to you. When you hear the word colorblind, oh no. Can you go back? Oh no, why? <laughs> Come on. Please try with the <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Technology. So much fun. <laughs> I'm not, I should be in Chrome. Okay, well, okay, this is a bummer. Uh, maybe, maybe during the stretch break I'll see if I can get this working again. Okay, so then people are going to have to just talk out loud. Uh, <laughs> what does the word colorblind mean to you? When you hear the word colorblind, what does it bring up? Yes? Like not acknowledging someone's lived experiences as... Their, their identity. Not acknowledging a person's experience as their identity. Yeah. <coughs> Any other thoughts? Yes. Dismissive of the people's experience. Dismissive of their yeah. identity. Yeah. Yes. You're trying to avoid or escape one's own um, racism and implicit bias by saying, I see everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Like white privilege. White privilege. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So one of the things, as you notice by the title, I'm calling this uh, the impact of color invasive practices, not color blind practices. And this is part of the reason why I'm making this shift. Because when we talk about color blindness, we are making an assumption that people just don't see color. But the reality is people do see color, right? We see each other's physical differences. And to say that we're being blind connotes that we have a visual impairment and that is not the case at all. So we're falsely equating it with a disability. Um, so color evasiveness is actually more accurate to what we're talking about. All the things that you all mentioned, right, are really more about evading this discussion or evading the reality that we are impacted by somebody else's race or ethnicity. So color evasiveness is really about like I don't want to acknowledge your color or your race or your background rather than I just don't see it. Some of the other things to be thinking about is that there's kind of this um, implicit idea that if you're colorblind you're race neutral um, and that if I don't have to acknowledge it, then I don't have to acknowledge that racism exists. I don't have to acknowledge that maybe I have some privilege over you in di different ways. Um, so it just kind of encourages people being passive, just saying like, I'm colorblind and that should be good enough because I'm a good person, I'm a nice person, that's fine. Um, you know, and it allows us to not really have to focus on the structural aspect of our society, which is really a hierarchy based on race as one of the different things, race, gender, a number of different identities, but particularly race is really salient. And this is what happens, you know, Colbert's 
joke statement here is actually the way a lot of white adoptive parents uh, approach being adoptive parents to children of color. And so this is manifested by parents saying things like, my parents, who, you know, they did what their social worker told them to do. Their social worker back in 1970 told them, just treat her like any of your other kids. But that meant for them, treat, the, treat me white. Assimilate me. That was the whole idea. She'll adjust better if you just make her American. But American means white, right? To too many people. So when they, they so they thought they were being good parents. They were doing exactly what they were told to do. Um, and they would say things like, I don't see you as Korean. You're just my daughter. Okay, so that's this color blindness. That's this whole idea is like, you're my daughter, and so I'm just going to see you as my, like my other daughter, uh, my sister, who's white. So color evasiveness was actually a term kind of coined and developed by uh, a friend of mine who's also a transracial adoptee scholar, Subini Anima. She's at Stanford University. And so she talks about color evasiveness as uh, actively choosing not to acknowledge race and racism. Um, that allows people to deny that race continues to negatively affect people of color and that it's really about blaming the victim. So if a person of color is having a hard time, then it must be because of their own individual failings. It can't be because the system is set up to harm them or put up obstacles in their way. And as uh, Ibram Kendi says, you know, there's no neutrality when we're talking about racism and the, and the struggle one either allows racial inequalities to persevere as a racist or confronts racial inequalities as an anti-racist. There's not an in-between safe space of just being not racist. And so color evasiveness really is racism because we're not acknowledging it and we're not doing anything to promote anti-racism. And this is really going to affect children of color. Okay, so how might color evasiveness show up in adoption work? Any ideas? <coughs> yes. Um, prioritizing like, the adoption of like younger aged children. Prioritizing the adoption of younger aged children in order to fulfill the Modeling of, you know, of oh, okay. So we're talking. So with children of color, if we can get them adopted younger, then they can be assimilated earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. I think you, your own example of telling adoptive parents to treat them just like your other children and assimilate them into your home and really not thinking about the nuances of having a child of a different background. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I think another layer of it is called the savior piece of it. Same um, thing. If you're doing international adoption, oftentimes like, well, if I can help this kid, again, assimilate to <coughs> America, I'm kind of doing them a favor, and then mm -hmm. adjusting and adapting as I go. Yeah, for sure, thank you. One of the things that I find really interesting when I do research with um, adoptive parents who choose international adoption and children of color um, is that they think that their kids, they associate their kids more with their cultural, uh, kind of like folk culture and not necessarily as a racialized person. So um, they might say, oh, well, we, I really like Korean culture, but they don't really see their child as being Asian like an Asian woman or an Asian man or Asian American. Same thing, they might adopt from Ethiopia and say, oh, my child is Ethiopian. But racially, they're going to be seen as black in this country. So if you're not talking about their blackness and how they fit into the larger black community, then being Ethiopian is one aspect of it, but it's not going to solve them from experiencing the same things that other black people in this country are going to experience. Any other ways? Yes. doesn't have anything to do with that. Um, so kind of picking and choosing 
what you know race has to do with it and that where it's excluded um, can really make a child feel kind of disempowered or not believed. Yeah, that's good. So we call that racial <coughs> Yeah. Yes. I think another layer is even talking about the cultural abuse, so I'm thinking about like black youth that are adopted by white families who are trying to learn how to like do their hair, yes. and the things that would is probably being like a black individual. So but yeah. just trying to see make it seem like everything is the same, which actually would do any more harm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, um there's examples of families who adopt say from Latin America and they have all the trappings on their walls or you know, like you said, the culture is there. It, it sort of superficially, mm-hmm. but as far as how they treat their kids, actually, in one case, I think that they were seen as other in the house, <coughs> like they were treated differently. They wanted to be the for accelerated and so on. So it can happen that, yeah, okay, we adopted you from wherever it was, and, and here's the pictures on the wall. That's it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think also going on to like this white saviorism kind of thing, yeah. especially with international kids um, and like Africa, I'm thinking like white parents need to save their kids from destruction and war and poverty and stuff and kind of having them grow up to like be grateful mm-hmm. that they were adopted mm-hmm. and kind of that shame and punishment almost kind of thinking that they some of the things that maybe you should be great to like a document from the man because you want to do that's what I Yeah, you should be grateful. So um if any of you are familiar with the work of Angela Tucker, um, she just wrote a book called You Should Be Grateful and it's about exactly what you're talking about, you know, stories of adoptees. Um, yeah. So thank you everybody, all of your comments. Yes, exactly. Those are all ways that color evasiveness shows up in adoption practices. And I'm gonna um, actually go a little bit further on some of the points that you made already. You're kind of uh, anticipating. But I, a few other things first. Um, so here's other ways it can show up. <coughs> it can show up in being hesitant to bring up race and racism with prospective adoptive parents. And this is really challenging, especially if you work in the public child welfare system, because we actually have legislation that restricts, to some degree, what we can do to help prepare parents, right? It's called the Multi-Ethnic Placement Act and Inter-Ethnic Provisions Act. So if you haven't learned about this yet, you will be learning about it, but it is a real constraint. So this is legislation that was created in 1994, and then IEP was 1996. And it was created with the idea that there were too many black kids lingering in the foster care system. And so we needed to be able to stop waiting to match them with black adoptive families or black foster families because that was delaying their uh, entrance out of foster care. What it actually ended up doing though was privileging white foster parents who wanted to adopt black kids over relatives, kinship, placements, those sorts of things too. So most of the research has shown it did a little bit, but it didn't really address the disparities of black children in foster care and waiting long times in foster care because it's not really getting to the root of what the problem was, which is their overrepresentation in the entrance into foster care itself. Um, some other things to be thinking about too is that um, with the Multi-Ethnic Placement Act and Inter-Ethnic Provisions, the um, the, penal- the financial penalties for agencies who violated it, meaning that they maybe asked the prospective adoptive parent to do extra homework that they didn't ask uh, a black foster family to do, um, that could be a violation. But the other part of the legislation was that states and agencies were required to recruit and retain a diverse pool of families that represented the kids in care. No money was attached to that to help agencies' effort, efforts to hire more people to recruit and do retention work. Um, and there's no financial penalty if agencies violate that. So this is an example of structural racism. Right? When we privilege one aspect that benefits white adoptive parents and harms prospective black adoptive parents, right? Um, so some other things, uh, discriminating against BIPOC prospective adoptive parents in the home study process. 
So there's been a lot of research that shows that there are barriers. Some of them are really what you would think seems very minor, but um, where agencies are recruiting, where they're going to, um, you know, if, if it's a predominantly white agency and they don't have staff of color um, who are involved in the communities of color, then how are they going to know where people are and what kind of conversations to have? And if you understand the way kind of the systems have treated um, people of color, especially African Americans, then you'll know that when people enter these systems, um, there's extra surveillance, there's uh, these expectations for them around, uh, one of the big things around um, uh, African American adoption, prospective adoptive parents, especially back in the 80s and the 90s, were uh, questions around if the mom was working. They wanted stay-at-home moms, or they wanted moms that could take time off and have more flexibility. And so agencies routinely discriminated against black families because the mom was working full time. It wasn't about whether or not they could provide care. It wasn't whether or not they had daycare. It wasn't about the income. Sometimes it was about the income, but a lot of it was around whether or not mom was going to be at home. Um, so some of these things where you think now, 20 years later, what were we doing? Why were we discriminating against all these families? Um, so we need to look at our agency practices. Um, I talked about the recruitment and retention already. Again, upholding middle, uh, middle class white standards for what families are supposed to look like, where they should live, um, and how they should work. So I remember well, I had this youth on my case who, um, there was a older auntie, a woman, not biologically related, but somebody that was kind of like an auntie figure in a church, and she wanted to adopt him. Uh, and you know, he was a 14 year old, so was, there's not like a line of people waiting for a 14 year old black youth. Um, but he, some of the other workers at the agency, because remember my job was solely to be the recruitment for this youth, so he was my primary, um, he was my primary client, but the other adoption worker was really concerned about where she lived, because she didn't live in a good neighborhood. But she lived in the neighborhood that he was used to. Right where he knew, and so he would have not had to change schools. He could have stayed in his community, but in some ways, it was seen as being like not the right neighborhood, you know. And so this was in you know 2006, 2007. So not that long ago, really. Other ways, lacking uh, staff of color or BIPOC staff are only in lower entry level positions, not in management and supervisory <coughs> positions. Focusing on celebrating culture instead of addressing racism. And this one I saw a lot when I was reading home studies as a child welfare worker. Parents who um, were supported in being open to biracial black children, Asian or Latin children, but not full black children. And some of the reasons why they would say it is, well, I would be open to adopting a black child, but I don't know if my neighbors or my family would be okay with it. So really privileging the, the anything but black mentality. So these are ways that it shows up in adoptions. Right? Now that I've laid this out, any other thoughts or ideas, things that you've seen, comments? And so one of the things that we really have to confront is that there's a lot of systemic racism in child welfare. <coughs> we have a le legacy of separating black families through slavery and through the practice of binding out. Binding out was after slavery uh, was abolished, that there were a lot of children, then binding out was basically like an indenturing back because uh, families were maybe unresourced, under-resourced, and they couldn't uh, maybe support all their kids, and so some of these kids actually went back to former slave-owning families and worked as indentured servants, and they were separated from their families through this practice. Um, in the 1960s, right as the civil rights movement was really um, gaining some steam and um, people were organizing, um, the Moynihan Report came out that basically was all about the dysfunction of black families and that they were culturally dysfunctional. Um, without really recognizing the impact of slavery and Jim Crow and the ways that 
our country had really tried to break up families and now we were like blaming the victim for being dysfunctional, for uh, parents not being married and raising children. Again, all these things that we expected of middle class white families, um, we had intentionally tried to destroy in black families and now we were saying, look, you're not like white families anymore and so that's, your, that's a problem. Um, at around the same time, there was really a large uh, disproportionate surveillance of um, black mothers and really good readings on this are um, Dorothy Roberts' book, uh, Shattered Bonds, The Color of Child Welfare. Um, that's, a, that's one uh, from around 2000, I think. It's, it's a really good book and it kind of demonstrates the way the child welfare system has really uh, treated black families. And then just social worker bias, and so we know that black and indigenous children around the country are overrepresented and white children are underrepresented in care. So what this means is, um, in particular, and I thought about this a lot, because I have, you know, just over the years, I've encountered a lot of uh, adults, people I've worked with who are white, who um, had really dysfunctional families. They experienced abuse and neglect in their families, and their families were never involved in the child welfare system, even though other people in their community knew it. So they weren't reported, but families of color, the slightest infraction, somebody is calling the police or making a child welfare report on them. So we have both overrepresentation, but we also have underrepresentation that works kind of together. So somebody brought this up already, um, this idea about having artifacts on the wall or cultural um, things from uh, a child's cultural heritage. And I call this celebration diversity. And we see this a lot, not just in child welfare practices, we see this a lot in our society. So child, um, celebration diversity um, have, to me, these five different components to it. We've got passive consumption, uh, shallow participation, celebrating appropriation, removing context, and then promoting civil right policies that unequally benefit white people. So passive consumption, I call this the um, Disneyland, uh, it's a small world ride. Okay, so anybody who's been to Disneyland or Disney World and gone on It's a Small World, you're sitting in your little boat and it goes through and you see all these representations of little children in folk costumes singing and dancing. You're not actually engaging with it, you're just floating by. Your entire uh, engagement with it is just kind of passive. Okay? You just, you're just seeing it. Um, so it allows you to kind of appreciate it and say, oh, that's really pretty, that's really cute, I like that, um, but not have to go any deeper. Shallow participation is what I call, like, you see something happening and you put up a sticker on your Facebook page, um, or, you know, you say, like, oh, I, I'm against this, or I'm for this. Uh, but again, that's the extent to your participation in it. You're not actually engaging in communities to find out what's happening at the community level and what you could be doing to help support the community, but you're letting everybody know that you believe it. You believe what's going on. So this is shallow participation. Celebrating appropriation. There have been a number of stories about black and indigenous children in high school or in elementary school who are forced to change their hair, to cut their braids, to do things like that. Um, this particular example was this um, boy had some locks. He was playing high school and uh, it violated the community rules about having braids and so for him to play, they cut his braids, they cut his locks. But if you're a celebrity, you can wear dreads and everybody thinks you're super cool. Right, so it's saying like if you are actually, it's celebrating certain kinds of cultural practices that other people from those communities, when they practice it, they get punished for it or disciplined for it. Culture out of context. This is a little bit deeper than the It's a Small World. This is where you might actually go to a Chinese New Year festival or you may actually go to a Cinco de Mayo uh, celebration or of some sort. So you might, do the holiday thing, the fun thing, but again, you're engaging only in that one part of it, the celebrating part. You're not necessarily engaging with the community about what is a community experiencing right now, especially in terms of racism and oppression or discrimination, and how are you getting involved in those communities to show your support and your allyship with them. 
uh, removing cultural context. So I am. A, I love to cook. I'm big into cooking and baking. Great British Bake Off. Love it. Uh, this is from Smitten Kitchen. So if anybody's seen Smitten Kitchen, she's Deb Perlman. She's written a bunch of books. She has a really prolific blog. And I love her recipes. So one day she posted this on her Instagram and she said, crispy rice and egg bowl. And um, as if she invented this recipe. When there are uh, so many Asian cultures, cuisines, that have a version of this. This looks like bibimbap to me, which is Korean, right? Um, and she actually, she did retract because a number of people on her comments said, why are you talking about this as if you made up this recipe when this is Korean, there's a Chinese version of it, there's a Vietnamese version of it, like you're, you're taking it out of the cultural context. It would be fine to say I adapted this from Korean bibimbap or something like that, right? But she didn't do that. So again, just ways that things are appropriated um, without giving kind of the deeper context to it. And what does it mean, you know, to be really steeped in the cuisine? We can all enjoy different food. I, I love it all. But food is really meaningful for a lot of people. Food is like the center they grew up. Um, you know, with their parents and their grandparents making food together and enjoying that food. So there's something really uh, familial about enjoying that food from your culture. Um, when you're a child and you're raised outside of that culture, food is one of the ways you can really help become more centered and get connected back to it. A lot of families don't know how to cook their child's cuisine, the things that, that they grew up, would have grown up having. And then I talked about this already with the Multi-Ethnic Placement Act and inter-ethnic provisions. One of the things, if you go back and look at news articles from the 1990s when this was the big debate, you'll see that uh, white foster parents were saying that um, it was a violation of their civil rights and it was racist because they weren't allowed to adopt the black kids that they had in their foster care at the time. Right? So it's using and appropriating the language of civil rights to uh, a group of people who already have all the rights and the privileges. Any questions or comments so far? Thoughts? Let's take a little bit of a stretch break. So stand up, move around. If you need to run to the bathroom, get some coffee. Racial identity is going to affect a young person and an adult uh, adoptee throughout their lifespan. So let's start with Bronfenbrenner's ecological systems um, theory. And so those of you who are students, this might be fresh in your mind still. If you have graduated, you have to think back a little bit like, what did we talk about? Um, but what uh, the ecological systems theory, you know, we're talking about all these different aspects of uh, a person and the way they develop over their lives and those environments that they are um, existing in. So when we think about the adoptee as kind of the center, as the individual person, um, thinking about their immediate environments, who are the people closest to them, their parents, their people in their neighborhoods, their school systems, their friends, um, and the interactions that they're having with folks there. What might be some ways that race for a, a transracial adoptee might show up in these close systems? Some of them have already been mentioned around um, parent dynamics, but thinking about schools, thinking about neighborhoods, thinking about churches, what might be some things that might come up that could affect an adoptee here in their identity? Yes? Um, from school, like not having friends that look like them? Yes. Not having friends that look like them at school. Yeah. Yes. Depending on the age of the child, not having their primary language spoken at school. Not having their primary language potentially. Yes. Absolutely. Any other? <coughs> yes. I just kind of want to say. You know, your family is in that microsystem, mm -hmm. um, and you feel protected with them, but when you go to the church or school, you're not. You're, you don't have that umbrella of protection. Yeah, so you don't have an umbrella of protection once you leave your family system. Yeah. 
Yes. I think an extended family, there might be a little bit of a difference. The other end of end, where you feel like I'm the same thing in your immediate family, but then your extended family might not see you as a part of the larger family system. Absolutely. So the extended family, too. Um, I'll give you two examples. Uh, both of them relate to um, funerals that I attended uh, for family members. So in one of them, um, most recently had happened um, a year ago, just about a year ago, um, as the only Asian person in this, uh, at attending this funeral, nobody recognized me as a member of the family. Right? So my husband is white and all the people thought he was a sibling, but not me. Um, but contrast that to maybe 15 years ago, my uncle passed away and I attended that funeral, and my aunt introduced me to everybody as the adopted child, mm -hmm. uh, even though you know, I was in my 30s at the time. So they're like, this, you know, this is Dick and Carla's adopted child. Of course, it was obvious, because I was the only Asian person there again. <laughs> yes. I have another example. Okay. So my father passed away, and I was in the receiving line, and someone came through and said, oh, are you his wife? Oh, somebody he mistook you for his, yeah. your father's wife, yeah. So these are the sorts of things that happen in these larger extended family situations that people aren't prepared for. Nobody, nobody thought about that, right? The meso system. These are the interactions and connections between different microsystems. So it could be between your parents and the school system. These are things that are sometimes happening outside of your individual knowledge that are happening. Conversations, things that influence. So I always use the example like if your parent is having some issues at work, sometimes it filters through at home. You don't necessarily know that's happening, but it's happening kind of in this larger and it affects your environment. So what might be some ways that in the larger meso system um, things are happening that can affect a, an adoptive color or transracial adoptee? Any ideas? Yes. Think about interactions with professionals like social workers, physicians. Yes. Yeah, interactions with other professionals. I say like parent-teacher conferences is kind of a big one. Again, with the school system. Okay. The macro system is about the larger cultural values that influence and affect uh, an adoptive color's life. What might be some things that are happening in the larger culture that's going to affect a transracial adoptee? Yes, you have two over here. Um, like maybe what's going on politically. So like if say if we were going back to like 2020, 2021, there were George Floyd like uprisings, yeah. and a white family was a black adopted child, kind of like the influence of that, like how yeah. you can see that in the way the larger I guess one system like reacted to that. Yes. Political system, the larger political culture, absolutely. I mean about policy around um, the K through 12 uh, <coughs> race theory stuff, like teaching that kind of stuff in school, in the school system, like uh, that policy about that. And we've seen like other states are on either side on that, but like, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So when schools in the K-12 system, school boards are saying we can't teach about critical race theory, they're, they're going even farther than that. They're saying we can't have these diverse books, we can't do anything that's identity-based, right? Yeah, so absolutely that is, that is definitely the policy. Just even things the way adoptees are represented in books, in media, I mean, I think it's really interesting because over the past couple of years, we've started to suddenly see more adoption stories. There have always been adoption stories, but more where they're kind of taking front and center. Um, and so that all affects adoptees too. Um, in my community, among Korean adoptees and Chinese adoptees, the movie Joyride was really controversial. Some people felt like, oh, finally we have an Asian lead character who's an adoptee, who is telling this, you know, going on this journey. Other people felt like it was full of tropes and it didn't do a very good job of representing Asian adoptees. Now, wherever you stand on it, the important part is, are you in community with other adoptees to hear all the different um, nuances around this, right? Because um, people are going to take it in different ways. I feel the same thing around um, when we think about 
Colin Kaepernick, who's a transracial adoptee, um, when he wrote his graphic novel, the headlines were saying things like, Kaepernick accuses his parents of racism. The, the fact that they use the term accuse instead of he talks about the racism he experienced growing up. So headlines, things, these are all very influential to people who maybe don't have a lot of knowledge around transracial adoption, and it helps them form these ideas and these beliefs about it. The other thing to think about with Bronfenbrenner's um, theory is that there's this chronosystem, meaning that there's change over time. So how a person is when they're a child, when they're six years old, versus how they are at 16 or 26 or 46 changes. So what are some ways in which a chronosystem system is going to be uh, influential on a transracial adoptee? Any ideas? Yes? The younger you are, you have no choice but to assimilate, but the older you get, you start, you start to find yourself, you start to question, you start to wonder, you start to see. You yeah. Just find your own identity the older you get. Yes. Yeah, the older you get, the identity becomes really important, right? Yeah. I think adding on to that, the authority is still with the family that's adopting, so sometimes they will make that choice for the kid of not allowing them to find those answers for identity yeah. or any of the seeking that they have. Yeah. So a couple of things that I hear from adult adoptees. Um, when they were younger, they if you were to ask them, how do you feel about being a transracial adoptee? All cool. It's great. It's awesome. No problem. Uh, even when they're in their early tween elementary or um, teenage years, uh, they just probably wouldn't say anything about it. They're not going to talk about it. Mostly because they've experienced trying to talk about it and have found that the parents are really uncomfortable talking about their incidences when you talk about like saying, I experienced this racism at school, I'm being told everybody gets teased for something, I'm sure it wasn't that. You know, the parents are trying to affirm and help their child, but they're actually gaslighting them by telling them that it doesn't exist. And it doesn't exist because they don't see it, because they haven't experienced it, right? They're not trying to be mean most of the time. It's with good intent. But the effect is unfortunately kind of the opposite. What it does is it shuts down those conversations for the future. So adoptees um, who become adults when they're participating in research around communication with their adoptive parents, Sarah Dokken Morgan wrote research, she's at UW um, La Crosse, and her research is on communication in adoptive families. And what she found is that adult Korean adoptees were not telling their parents about these things that were happening to them. Um, and because either they had tried before and were shut down, or they felt their parents couldn't handle it, that their parents were going to be too emotionally distraught, and they didn't want that extra burden of having to care for their parents' feelings when they were experiencing these, these incidents. Um, and then to your point, um, Jaya John, who is a transracial black adoptee and a motivational speaker as a social worker, um, he said uh, when he was little, he was seen as a cute little teddy bear, brown teddy bear, but he grew up to be a big black grizzly in society's eyes. And to me, that quote really has always struck with me because it's the way that we position kids as being cute. Kids of color are cute, but then they grow up. They don't even have to grow up a lot. They, by the time they're teenagers, they're seen as adults, even though they're still teenagers. So we don't give them the same kind of um, latitude that we might with a white teenager, um, where we say they're just developing still, their cognitive functioning isn't fully online yet because they're still adolescents. But if you're black, then they're supposed to know what they're doing and we can treat them as adults. So yeah, these are all, thank you everyone. Uh, Erickson psychosocial development. This is really when we're thinking about identity and the different tasks that adoptees have over the life course. Um, David Brodzinski has a book um, about being adopted, the lifelong search for self, and he <coughs> talks about all the additional developmental tasks that adoptees have to do. But I would add that as adoptees of color, there's even more. And when we're talking about the identity, which is usually in the adolescent years, um, we so I'm working on an adoptee consciousness model right now with two other colleagues and one of the things that we're finding is that this idea of there being a rupture in your life where you're going in status quo for most of this 
uh, identity development and then at some point usually it's between the teen years but we've seen it as I had a woman in a focus group um, who was in her 60s who was like COVID and the anti-Asian sentiments that I was seeing the racism around COVID shook me out of my status quo like I suddenly full on went into this rupture because everything that I thought I knew disintegrated right so it can happen in lots of different times traditionally we think that identity development always happens in the late teenagers young adult years but for adoptees it happens over and over again because things that happen to them is um, they move away from their home they're maybe going to college or they're working someplace and they're around um, you know, as was said over here, they're not in their protective bubble anymore, and suddenly people are treating them as if they're a person of color, and they don't know how to do that. They don't know who they are, they don't know how to exist as a person of color. When people um, of their own racial reference group reach out to them, it's scary for a lot of transracial adoptees. They don't want to have anything to do with other people that look like them and that's a real disservice to them. Um, they feel like they're uh, frauds, they have imposter syndrome, all these are things that I hear from adult transracial adoptees. So thinking about you know, <coughs> all the different aspects of development and thinking about what it means to be a person of color raised without um, any kind of racial socialization is really what I, I'm talking about here, racial and cultural socialization. And most of this is because their parents don't have these skills because they don't know. And they weren't um, provided these resources. And then when we talk about Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs and thinking about all the different um, physical and uh, emotional and uh, other needs that we have, we tend to think of it oftentimes as this um, uh, triangle that's a that's a ladder like first you have to meet the first one and then you can once that's resolved you can go on to meet the second one um, but with adoptees with the Harlow's monkey experiments we've seen that that's not necessarily true right monkeys will forego food for a sense of um, safety love and belonging um, so when we're thinking about kids and child welfare we're really focused on the first two we're really focused on making sure they're getting all their basic needs met and that there's safety, especially physical safety. Um, but are we thinking in terms of what they're going to need for their love and belonging, their self-esteem, when we're moving them school to school to school so they can't develop relationships there? We're actually harming attachment the more often we're moving kids around. So we need to make sure that when we're preparing them for permanency, that those families are really thinking long term. If there's one message I can really get across today is that when we're thinking about uh, adoptees of color, we should be thinking about their long, long term trajectory, not just until they turn 18. Okay, so. The research has found that when youth and young adults have a strong sense of racial and ethnic identity, it's actually a protective factor for dealing with oppression, racism, and discrimination. And so these are just some of the studies that have talked about uh, protective factors being embedded in racial and ethnic identity. Uh, April Harris Britt looked at African American youth. Cindy Sangalong looked at Cambodian youth and the National Indian Child Welfare Association has done a lot of work with Native American youth and they found that even when youth have high adverse childhood experiences that they're buffered and protected if they have a strong sense of connection to their elders in their community and especially with the um, American Indian uh, youth with uh, their language. Um, so these are all just some of the many studies that have really looked at this, this issue. Now I look also at um, racial and ethnic socialization for Korean adoptees and I, I was part of uh, a study that interviewed 52 adult Korean adoptees who had all had kids. And we looked at their um, racial socialization practices, their ethnic socialization practices, and their adoption socialization practices. So racial means are they thinking about and talking with their own kids about preparation for discrimination, how to handle discrimination when it confronts them in their families, what to say to people when they say things at school. Um, so just like preparation for bias. Um, 
helping them understand the history of racism for their community, um, right? For the ethnic socialization, it's really around ethnic pride. So how do they feel being Korean? How do they um, associate? Uh, what kind of uh, feelings do they have towards other, other Korean people, other Asian people? And then adoption socialization is really around like how do they talk about their own adoption stories, their adoption histories to their kids. And one of the things that we found out is that they didn't know how to do that, any of it. They were practicing based on what they learned from their parents, which was usually color blindness, color evasiveness, um, and uh, that we just don't want to talk about these hard things. So especially as children, um, you know, they would say things like, yeah, you know, my parents were, they didn't want to talk about, they just said, we don't see you as being whatever, you're, you're just like one of us, you know, what, what that means. So then they grow up, and then they have their kids, and then they have this kind of reckoning, like, oh, my kids are Korean too, and I don't know anything about being Korean, and what am I going to teach them about being Korean? And so it was really challenging for them. Um, So color evasiveness is um, developmentally harmful to use of color because it can interfere with our normal identity development. It creates this lack of preparation and skills to deal with it, um, with racism and discrimination. So they go off to college, um, they go off to work, and then people are saying things and they don't, they don't know how to respond at all. Um, they can also internalize racism and carry those same messages that maybe they heard uh, growing up by their friends, their parents, their schools, their communities. And it, so it may make them um, distrust people from their own cultural and racial reference group too. And one of the things I'm very concerned about is adoptees' relationships long term with their adoptive parents and their adoptive families. Because what we find is that this creates estrangements in their families. So when we're thinking about practicing and we're thinking about providing a forever family to these kids, in care, um, is it still going to be a forever family if the tensions are so great that by the time the child's 17, 18, they're breaking those relationships with their families? Or sometimes the parents are breaking the relationship <coughs> with the child because they want to talk about this. And, and what I found in these focus groups um, that I conducted last uh, spring is that these uh, adult adoptees were saying, George Floyd and COVID, like the combination of the two of them, um, made many of them uh, start to uh, have really tough relationships with their adoptive families because they would want to talk about it because they were feeling targeted every day and they'd go out, um, or not even go out, they'd read the news and they would see incidents that were happening and their parents were um, not at all empathizing with them, they didn't have any compassion. Sometimes they were repeating really harmful messages, um, telling them, well, you just don't be like that, um, and just really dismissing and gaslighting their experiences. Um, and so many of them stopped talking to their families at this time. One of the things we're kind of looking at is estrangement in adoptive families. Again, this is something that when you're dealing with kids, nobody's thinking in the fact that by the time they're 25, they're not going to have a relationship with their families anymore. But this is what is happening. Um, people were talking about um, their parents saying and supporting uh, no more immigrants, and they were internationally adopted. And so the kind of dissonance of knowing that you were adopted from another country, but your parents don't want any other immigrants to come to this country was something that was really hard for a lot of adoptees. So again, adoption professionals really might hesitate to talk about race and racism and racial identity with the parents as they're kind of preparing them for potentially adopting transracially. And so then that means that they're less prepared to talk about it. And then they will implement color evasive parenting approaches, which is going to influence their child eventually. Okay, so color evasive practices, they can really hurt adoptive parents because if you think about it, then, you know, they're less prepared. They're less prepared to have these conversations and to think about and start, um, you know, especially in the school systems, like how, 
If we can start helping them think now about what might happen in the school system, if they're talking with their peers or their teachers, how they can get involved to advocate on behalf of their child. Um, you know, adoptive parents oftentimes are really um, skilled at thinking about um, their educational needs for their kids, but they usually don't think at all about the child's racial needs or cultural needs. Um, this is a big one for me. The next one is really that it can affect authentic relationships with their child because their child is going to be withholding their feelings and information that could be really beneficial to their relationship as parent and child. It promotes unsafe spaces for communication. It could potentially be a disruption for that child. <coughs> And color evasive practices can hurt agencies too because again, it can promote a false optimism about the impact of race, racism, discrimination to adoptive parents. Again, if we're not meeting the developmental needs of children of color, if we're not incorporating policies and practices in our own agencies, it creates unsafe spaces for adoptive families to talk about it openly. And it promotes the perception that the agency doesn't really care about communities and people with color's experiences with racism and injustice. Okay, so I have some case studies. <coughs> and what I'm gonna do is have you in your tables talk about some of these and then we'll, we'll kind of report back. So what I want you to think about is from the adoptee's perspective, what are the transracial adoptee identity challenges that these adoptees are experiencing and then what would you maybe go back and tell the adoptive parents to help them understand the child's perspective right now, as it is right now. And then if you could go back in time, what suggestions might you have for how these parents could help support their child's identity? So we'll do maybe just a quick five minute for each of these. Um, we'll go one by one and then we'll report out. Okay, so the first one, here's, here's Maria. And these are all adult adoptees because again, I want you to be thinking about the long term and what we might be able to do now to kind of help prevent this from happening in the future. Okay, so we've got Maria, she's 27. She's a Latina transracial adoptee. Uh, Patricia is a single mom by choice to Maria, she adopted, who she adopted at four years old. And their relationship has always been rocky. Maria had a difficult time adjusting to the adoption and the language differences. Patricia did not speak any Spanish. Maria was also diagnosed with ADHD and struggled in school. Maria completed an AA through a community college and has consistently worked at a variety of jobs, but often quits hastily and with some drama. Likewise, Maria has lived with Patricia on and off again as an adult and currently lives with her. According to Maria, Patricia is old fashioned and racist. This is because Patricia feels like Maria's Latinx friends are a quote unquote bad influence. When Maria lives with Patricia, she complains about how she's treated in the predominantly white suburb where Patricia lives. In fact, Maria has been profiled a number of times and once a police officer said to her, aren't you a long way from home? She's been saying she's going to move because she doesn't want to live in such a white town. Patricia acknowledges she has some prejudices against the Latinx community, particularly around immigration and gangs, and she feels she saved Maria from a life of poverty. However, she doesn't want to lose a relationship since Maria is the only family she has. Despite the complaints, she feels better when Maria is living with her and is upset every time Maria moves out. Okay, so in your groups, talk about the adoptee's perspective. And then what would you tell the parents to help them? So from Maria's perspective, what are some of the challenges they're experiencing? What were some things that came up at your table? So from Maria's perspective, what is she experiencing? Yes. Um, profiling is Yeah, the profile. That actually it was a real life experience that happened to a friend of mine. A police officer said, aren't you a long way from home? And they were going to that house. Other, anything else? She just really disconnected from her own culture, right? She has no mm -hmm. idea, and I feel like they need to embark on this together. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. So that might then kind of go into the next one, right? What would you tell the mom? Um, I would tell the mom that 
she needs to focus on the relationship and build the relationship by breaking down her prejudice that she has already in approaching the culture, both Latinx culture, with curiosity mm -hmm. and interest and learn together. And that is going, I, I believe, would bring them closer together. Yeah. Yeah. So with the Korean adoptive parents who are really struggling to figure out how they can bring in Korean culture to their children, um, they went through a process of what they call reculturation. So they were doing it side by side and running together. Yeah. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Yes. So if you could go back in time, what would be some things that you would implement or ask or or do with mom? Say it first. Have mom learn Spanish. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, have the kid go to a bilingual school. Have the kid go to a bilingual school. Hopefully there is one. Yeah. Other thoughts? Yeah. I would want to ask mom, like, what are you going to do in the household to incorporate yeah, what are you going to do in the hospital? If it's like, I don't know, if it's like, there's some resources. Yeah. Like, this is what I recommend. Right, there's some resources for her. Yeah. Yes? I mean, before, like, a placement is even discussed, like, you need to parse out her bias. Mm -hmm. Like, this isn't new. <laughs> this yeah. is there. Yeah. And so if you can parse out that bias, then the placement shouldn't happen. Like, Maria should not enter a space that's unsafe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's, I think, the biggest thing that you have to do for a place. We were talking sometimes the public child welfare system sits in crisis. Mm -hmm. It's like this child needs to go somewhere. <laughs> Whereas like international adoption, it's time to plan. Mm -hmm. So it's just a it's a tricky thing, but can you have these conversations to understand people's bias so that you don't put children on safe homes? Yes. <coughs> yes. I think kind of adding on to that would be asking Patricia the question, are you willing to learn? Because if you go back in time and the answer is no, then again this place can happen. And I know we were talking about um, what you would tell the adoptive parents to help them understand, but it almost seems like respectfully, um, <laughs> Patricia has like a lot of inherent racism. And so even through looking at the rest of this, it doesn't seem like she's even at the point that she wants to learn to say Marie is an adulthood and mm -hmm. still thinks what she thinks about the Latinx population. How many of you work, have worked with parents who you think maybe are trying to please you by saying things a certain way when it's actually maybe not true? Yeah, so I think that's the other thing is how can we figure out how to get to some of these core beliefs because people are going to say things because they want to adopt and you have the power to say yes or no to your child, right? Um, I say yes. Yeah, you have to be willing to be wanting to learn and being open to learn. I have, um, fr I'm friends with um, a family that adopted kids from um, Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. And, you know, fortunately they have the resources, but they have gone back to mm -hmm. Ethiopia. They have Ethiopian friends. Um, the mom has learned several of the recipes yeah. and learns how, you know, and, and, and puts that culture in their kids' face all the time. Friends and so the kids um, are not so far removed from their culture mm -hmm. because of what they have done. And so I think, um, families need to want to change and have the resources and maybe um, the agencies might be able to help with that, you know, and, you know, maybe offer, you know, like trips or offer, like, you know, gift cards to different restaurants, you yeah. know, and things like that to, to bridge the gap because not everybody has the money to do so. so. That's a good point, too. Yeah. Yeah, a couple of hands over here and then we'll come back. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Um, something that I used to too is that trust is built in the little moments and mm -hmm. that like yes uh bilingual school and um you know kind of trips and things like that of course would be amazing but i really appreciate that about the resources because i think these little moments of not supporting a friendship um mm -hmm. not listening um discounting a story from school mm -hmm. um when a child's being vulnerable about an experience they had and not 
listening or turning away. Like those are really pivotal moments. Um, so I think those little things too. So having some compassion for Patricia, right? Of like, how can we think about those little moments um, and empowering Maria to speak um, and really be listening to you? Yeah, there are opportunities, yes. Uh, back over here at the smart table. Oh, yeah. <laughs> sorry. I think also framing things as like a need instead of an option. So uh -huh. like a lot of our foster parents or adoptive parents learn so many wild things for children's needs to meet children's needs, right? But then framing these cultural aspects as like an optional thing, I think then doesn't push folks out of their comfort zone, right? So like Absolutely. framing it as a need forces parents to kind of learn for their kid, right? So Yeah, I, I really like that. Framing it as a need instead of a choice. Yeah. Yes. Um I think one big thing is just asking Patricia the hard questions. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of it like no Prince Brother said like compassion over there. I think a lot of white adopt like adopted parents are infantilized almost when they have when they adopt children of color, it's just like asking the hard questions and you're like, are you like, ready for this? Because you may mess up your kid's entire life. And instead of like putting kitty gloves around them mm -hmm. adults, mm -hmm. like just asking the hard questions and being like, hey, this is all this entails. What's your like thoughts about this community? What's your family's thoughts? What's all this? And kind of just doing the hard work before this kid gets into it. Yeah. yeah. Going off of that, just incorporating this stuff into like foster parent training before mm -hmm. they get their license, like educating them on culture and how important how important it is to incorporate that in their life. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's in the training. Yeah. But that isn't enough. And you learn so much in the beginning that it's so difficult to remember all those pieces by the yeah. time you get your placement and yeah. you need like the real what can I do? Right? Where do I go? We need to be able to provide that, those experiences, telling them where they can find that in the community and assisting in that. Yeah, yeah. So having, you know, resources available to point parents to because they oftentimes will come in a moment of crisis or when they realize, oh no, I'm in over my head. Um, and so like in addition to fr framing it as uh, a need and not a choice, um, I think the other thing that we can do is talk about how it um, encourages attachment because attachment's a really big hot word when we're talking about child welfare and placements. But again, if we're thinking about if the parents don't see providing racial and cultural support to their child in terms of their identity building throughout their childhood, it is gonna harm their attachment to them. It just, it just will. And they don't necessarily think of it in that way, but we need to help them understand how it does. Okay, ready for another one? We've got Jason, who's 32. He's multiracial, black Anishinaabe, white, transracial adoptee. Jason has always been close to his parents, Maureen and Jack, who also adopted Jason's three siblings. They're not biologically related, and they are all adopted from foster care. Jason and his partner Reggie are planning to get married and have started talking about having a family. However, while Reggie is interested in adopting from foster care, Jason is adamant he wants to have a child through surrogate using his sperm. To complicate things even more, Jason always identified as black and recently learned that his birth first mother was Native American and white. This has upended his sense of racial identity. Reggie supports Jason in finding out more about his birth mother, but Jason refuses to search. Maureen, Jack, and Reggie had become very frustrated with Jason's refusal to consider adopting. Maureen and Jack consider it an insult to their decision to adopt Jason and his siblings. They're siding with Reggie. Jason wants to postpone the wedding until he and Reggie can resolve the conflict about how they will become parents. Okay? So from the adoptee's perspective, what are they experiencing? And what would you tell the parents to help them understand where he's coming from? Experiencing as an adoptee, what what came up for you? Thoughts about what he's experiencing or thinking? Yeah. Um. So we talked about how we've been learning it. We 
um, he's Native American, maybe he wants to have like a biological kid to like pass that on. Mm -hmm. And also knowing the history of adoption of Native American population and like the violence we've done that, he probably just doesn't want to continue that. Mm -hmm. So he wants to pass down maybe some of his Native American yeah, ancestry. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts? Yes, he, yeah, he walked with that. Um, I was just talking about how I know a lot of adoptees uh, enjoy being able to have a biological child because maybe they've never been around folks that look like them. Yeah. And so that can be like an empowering way mm -hmm. to heal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's actually a big one I found with my research on, on adoptees who are parents. Um, first of all, there's very little research about adoptees who become parents. Um, and what we heard over and over again in our interviews was that having a child was the first biological connection that these folks ever had. And while they also can appreciate and feel close to their adoptive families, there's something really compelling about being able to have at least one person who looks like them or who shares their genetics, their genetic backgrounds. So that's really important for them. Um, anything else? Okay, what about, uh, what would you tell the adoptive parents? Anybody have some ideas what you could tell them? <laughs> I'm seeing some rolled eyes and stuff. Yes? <laughs> you know, just, just to tell them, give your son or daughter some space. Give them Part of it too, siding with his partner, isn't going to help because this is a conversation that the two of them need to make, right? Yeah. Okay. So we won't do a discussion about this, but I wanted to present just the last one so you can get an, another idea of what can happen. So here we've got Jenny. She's 42 and an Asian uh, um, transracial adoptee. Carol and Bob adopted Jenny, who is now 42, from South Korea when she was eight. The family grew up in a mid-sized community, and from Carol and Bob's perspective, Jenny seemed to fit in well and had friends, was a cheerleader, and earned good grades in high school. She went to the state's public university for college, became a teacher, and moved to a suburb. She married her college boyfriend, who is white, and they started a family, and Jenny and Dan now have two children. About five years ago, Jenny found out about a local Korean adoptee group and started to attend events. Carol and Bob were shocked when Jenny confronted them about not doing more to keep her connected to her Korean culture while she was growing up. She told them she was bullied in school and in the community, never felt like she fit in, and resents being adopted. Jenny informed her parents she did a DNA test. With the help of some of her new adopted Korean friends, she plans to visit Korea and do a birth family search. Carol and Bob are angry. They told Jenny she's being selfish and ungrateful, and as a result, Jenny has not talked to them in almost a year, and she's not allowed them to see their grandchildren. So, general thoughts? What is Jenny feeling right now? I mean, angry, of course, but anything else that's really coming up? What, what is prompting all of this, do you think? She has a right to know who her biological parents are. So she has a right to know who her biological parents are. Yes. And finding out who she is as like a Korean woman. Yeah, finding out who she is as a Korean woman. Kind of late in life, yeah. right? Yeah, in her 40s. Yes. I can see her being, um, from it being late in life, like regret or shame. Mm -hmm. not wanting to see that. Yeah, so regret and shame that it didn't happen sooner. Yeah. Yeah. And yet, oh yes. Yeah. Yeah, connecting it to her kids, right? Yeah. 
Anything that you would say? Oh, okay. Oh, I think she also feels like she has a lot of catching up to do. Some catching up to do. Yes. Yeah. Anything that you might be able to say to the parents right now to help them try to come to terms with what's happening, especially since they aren't aren't seeing their grandchildren right now. Yes. Right, so the idea about it's not her being selfish, that they also need to look at their selfishness. I think the whole part about expecting her to be grateful, right, and thankful, right, those sorts of comments aren't helping this relationship. So helping them understand how that's actually getting in the way of them having a relationship. Yeah. All right. Okay, so as we wrap up, one of the things that I used to do when I would train prospective adoptive parents is something that we call the bean cup exercise. Have any of you heard about this? Okay, so what I would do, and it's, it, I would take uh, different colored beads that kind of represented different skin tones, and what I would do is ask parents, so you'd have a, um, a plastic cup that's kind of see-through, and they would have tables of the beads, and I would ask them, okay, so, Put a bead in this cup that represents you, kind of your skin tone, um, what you represent, your uh, ancestry, if you're white, if you're black, if you're um, Asian, Latino, multiracial. Uh, you, if you have a partner, other kids in the home, and then your neighborhood. Is your neighborhood predominantly what color? Is what about your school, your child's teacher, their, their pediatrician, their doctor, um, their dentist? Um, who comes to your house most often? Your friends. Who are their friends? And inevitably what would happen is there would be a mostly white cup with maybe a couple brown tones in there, but mostly white. And then I would say pick up you know, a bead that represents what your child is likely to be and think about how that child's gonna fit into this world, right? So one of the things that we can do is help people visualize what it looks like because just thinking about it intellectually, you think, oh yeah, there's a lot of diversity around my town. But when you think like, who's the mayor and who's the principal at the school? And then you start to realize, oh actually, I don't live in a very diverse area at all. Um, so some things that we can be helping parents think about is who's represented in their organizations and in their systems, where they work, what neighborhood they live in, their church, their community, their activities, if they participate in any kind of hobbies, who's there. Um, to examine, to ask them to examine your proximate, proximate, proximate relationships with BIPOC people. So Austin Channing Brown is a speaker and writer and one of the things she talked about is the danger of having that one black friend or that one Asian friend whose your relationship is maybe at work and so you think you're really friendly and you over uh, estimate the closeness and think that then that means you have diversity in your life because you have one person who can tell you how it is. Right? So to be really thoughtful about whether or not this relationship is just this proximate relationship or if it's a true relationship. Are you at each other's homes? Are you going, you know, you're doing activities together outside of just seeing each other at, at work. Um, think about who you go to for advice and information about transracial and transnational adoption. Are you only going to other white parents or are you going to other people who have lived experience with this? Um, reflect on your assumptions about what constitutes good, meaning good schools, good neighborhoods, those sorts of things. I've had many parents say, well, our school system is really a good school system. It's like one of the best in our town or our state. And I'm like, but is it good for your black child? Like it actually might be a really bad school for your black child. It might be a good school if you're white, but is that still a good school? Because we're not just talking about academics, we're talking about their whole social, emotional well-being as well. And then reflect on what you want your relationship to look like. T 
10, 25, 35 years down the road? These are questions you can ask adoptive parents. We're gonna skip that one. Um, so things that organizations can do, educate leadership and board on why there are disparate numbers of BIPOC children in the child welfare system. Assess your agency's home study materials, processes, and policies for racial and cultural biases. You can look at fiscal and staff allocation for recruitment and retention of BIPOC foster and adoptive parents. And assess how agencies use white middle class standards for what families are supposed to look like, where they should live, where they work, uh, and what personal characteristics make up quote unquote good parents. We could be looking to see if they are supportive of racial and cultural identity development, whether or not that's considered part of the best needs of the child or in the best interests of the child. Because we use that standard a lot, um, and oftentimes we're talking about their physical, their uh, mental health, um, all these different aspects that are in their best interest, but we don't ask if their racial and ethnic uh, sense of well-being is also part of, part of this best interest. Um, some agencies actually have different adoption fees for kids based on race. The darker they are, the lower the fee. Um, assess who's considered experts on transracial adoption at their organization. And then how does the organization interface with BIPOC communities outside of just their organization and their involvement in placing children? Are they actually showing up and are they part of these communities? Are transracial adult adoptees included in the organization? Are they on the board of directors and advisory boards? Do they do workshops and trainings? You can audit the staff and board for representation and pow um, power there. Um, look to see whether or not all the BIPOC um, board members or staff are doing all the diversity work or if it's shared equally among the whole organization. And then look at um, in your trainings, orientations, and events for families. Are they focused on culture, these like other like shallow culture, uh, or are they focused on race and racism and helping them prepare for being racialized out in the communities and in their families? Okay, so questions. This is how you can find out more about me and. Um, also, uh, the reference page on the end has some of the research studies that I mentioned, and um, those will be available to you. So we've got a few more minutes, and I don't know, did we want to use this at all? Did anybody have any questions or comments? <laughs> Do you know if there's any? Do you know if there's any studies on like trans transracial adoption? On trans transracial adoptions, no. But I am finding more people in my research studies who identify as trans transracial adoptees, um, and so it's a unique process for them because there's multiple layers of identity development and kind of coming out and um, how they assert, and so. What they're finding is that in their trans queer communities, there's a lot of misinformation about racial identity and being adopted. And then in the adoption communities, there's a lot of misinformation about being trans and queer. So yeah, it's, it's starting to emerge, but right now I don't think there's any research specifically looking at that. So it would be a great opportunity. Yes? Just to piggyback off of that, I wanted to about the folks with disabilities, physical and mental disabilities, and how that intersection plays a role in all the research you're doing as well. Yeah, so one of the things, um, it hasn't been published in a study yet, but one of the things we're learning from the different research studies and focus groups that I've been doing is that um, adoptees who are quote unquote, we know that we're considered special needs because we're adoptees of color, and some of us also have actual disabilities. And that was part of the reason why we were available for adoption. Mm -hmm. So there is like this whole kind of um, kind of lack of recognition around the disabilities, and because so many adoptive parents, especially international, are looking for correctable disabilities. Mm -hmm. So, for example, a number of Korean adoptees I know had um, cleft palate and lip, and they came to the U.S. had the corrective surgery, and then their parents were kind of like, "So you're not disabled anymore." 
Um, and so the idea about identifying as somebody who is disabled is something that is becoming more of a conversation. <laughs> but I think there's some really great resources out there because um, the um, disability justice movement is really big. Um, and there are some pretty prominent adoptees who were part, who are and were, there's one that passed away recently, who are part of that. So we are seeing some more conversation about this overlap, but it's emerging just kind of like with the trans adoptees. Yes? Um, you know, I've also seen, uh, you know, in the, trans, the international adoption of a Latinx person who becomes involved in the community that is very much often seen as not really Latinx. So I don't speak with an accent and so on, and, that, and, and this person is also trans, but the trans community has been, I don't know how, yeah, it would be easier actually. I don't know. Any other questions or comments? Yes? Has there been any research done to see the effects of cha um, changing a child's name? Oh. And that kind of. Yeah, identity? so. There have been some qualitative studies. Um, there's a scholar in San Francisco named Jason Reynolds who's done some research looking at adoptees who changed their names. Um, these are small qualitative studies, but yeah, I, I mean, I was one of them too. I changed my name legally when I was 35 um, after I had been to Korea and done some search for my birth family. Um, so yeah, it's a kind of a reclamation is more what what they're doing, it's again kind of like this whole reculturation aspect. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of adoptees are changing their name or they're incorporating part of their birth name um, as adults. Yes? Do you find um, any children of adoptees who go and search for their parents? Um, do you find like uh, difficulty where their parents don't want to know about their birth yes. family, but the children do? Yeah, yeah. So this is kind of a also an emerging area of research. So uh, all of this is emerging because honestly, we haven't really done a lot of research on adult adoptees past college age. And so parenting, a lot of the birth search um, information is when they're in their young adult years and they may not even be thinking about doing a birth family search. But when adoptees uh, do find their first families and then they have a reunion, we're just starting to see information. There's a new book coming out. Sarah Dokin Morgan is talking about communication and birth families when Korean adoptees find their Korean first families. So that's coming out. Um, but we're kind of talking about like second generation. So there's second generation adoptive families and second generation adoptees. They're different. So we're finding adult adults whose parents were adopted are starting to take on this like we have this unique identity too because our parents were adopted. And especially if it was an international adoption, then you know, they're wanting to get more involved with their, because I had mentioned like they, parents don't know how to culturally socialize their kids. So they're taking it on themselves as adults. And um, so there's some right now in Korea that there's, I know there's a study that's in the works. Um, with a scholar named Omiel Kim out in at Boston University. She's just starting a study of kids of Korean adoptees, so Korean adoptee adult children. Yes, children of Korean adoptees uh, doing searches and uh, trying to get more information. But I also did a study um, that is under review right now of uh, Korean adoptees who adopt. And that's the other thing that we haven't really talked much about is when adoptees stopped. And, um, what hasn't been done yet are um, adoptees who are also first parents. And I know a number of adoptees who are also first parents, and we haven't done any research on that yet either. Anything else? I think we're at time. So, okay. Well, thank you so much for being here.